All right, welcome to the Tennis.com podcast. We are coming to you from the USTA National Campus in Nona. My name is Nina Pantic. I'm one of the co-hosts, joined by Irina Falcone. Hey guys, how's it going? Our guest for this episode is Craig Aker. Craig, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. Craig, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. What is the Craig Aker bio? Well, a quick bio here. Uh, we opened the national campus about three years ago, and I was able to come on board in a part-time capacity as they were developing the staff and got full-time uh, status last year. And I work with a lot of the top juniors uh, as well as the pros here that come to campus. And how long have you been in strength and conditioning? Is that your entire life? How do you get into this business? Yeah, my whole professional career has been in this field. I went to school for it for a bachelor's degree. I was an athlete, uh, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> football, basketball, baseball, played some college football. And I uh, just wanted to study what the heck was going on, why I felt the way I did. And then... Um, got into the field, just started working at health clubs. I was uh, then looking to work with more athletes. So I went to Florida State to uh, get my master's degree and was able to work with the collegiate athlete. And then in that period of time, started uh, working on the side with a private company, then moved over to that full time and helped run a company for 13 years. And then uh, went into another private setting here before coming on campus. <clears throat> Okay, so let's just talk about your day-to-day. -day. You are here, you live here in Orlando, you're based here mm -hmm. full-time. What would you say is your day-to-day, -day? like week in, week out? Is every week different? Do you, do you train juniors differently than you would train the pros? That's one of the things I like about the job is that it is different day-to-day -day and week-to-week, -week. Um, working with a young athlete versus an old, uh, healthy versus injured. Um, the job comes with some administrative work, but for the most part, you're up on your feet dealing with people, moving around. So, you know, I get a lot of energy from working with the kids uh, as I get older and older here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that helps a lot. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty uh, uh, exciting environment to be in. What, one of the reasons I got into the field is I'm like, I'm not going to sit behind a desk all day and have that kind of career, even though I do have to sit behind desks sometimes uh, and get that kind of work done. But it's fun. Have you been in tennis your entire career as a strength and conditioning coach? I've worked with uh, primarily all athletes uh, up until now in the tennis. Now I'm in a tennis only environment, which actually, you know, we could speak about if you, you'd like, but uh, worked with all kind of court sports, field sports, worked with the tennis player in those settings. Um, believe it or not, I worked with uh, Riley Opelka when he was. 12 or something like that oh, basically wow. before he grew almost a foot <laughs> uh so that was fun it was just a, a connection at the time with one of the strength coaches here that knew i was in the area where he was at and said hey you could you help him out so but other than that uh you know just here and there and you've worked with irena falcone here in the gym haven't you well of course what a pleasure we go way back what are her strengths and weaknesses <laughs> oh my gosh, you're really asking that. Okay. No, no, I'm not generally asking that. I'm not. But uh, so you work with juniors, you work with pros. Can you tell the difference between, you know, you work with Riley? Could you tell that he was going to be something special, that he had athleticism? Is it something you think about, or is it let's just get through a workout day to day? You're not really thinking, hey, man, this guy's a star. Uh, well, at that time, an example there was uh, he was literally just coming to me. He was driving 45 minutes or so just to do the physical training. I wasn't around him to see him play, so I wasn't able to say, you know, obviously he's very skilled and gifted, um, to say at that point. Um, now that I'm in the tennis-only environment, I mean, we, we do have a big challenge with our job. I mean, the tennis athlete is, is really overplayed and undertrained. Like, they, you know, a lot of fundamental physical qualities are not built up by just playing tennis and particularly just general you know, mobility and strength concepts that other sports may have um, and actually are more likely to train at younger ages. Tennis, just that's just not part of that culture. So that's been a challenge, but it's a great challenge because even what we've been able to do here in the last few years with our junior programming and how much we're doing for them, how much they're accepting of doing it, meaning committing to it and not just waiting to the end of the day to do it. They're actually starting their day with it. Like we've really seen some great progress there and that's the whole key is because you got to get them younger you got to start them earlier 
and the number one goal is injury prevention, right? And that's the, that's where it all always has to start. So for a junior parent, I know that when I was growing up, I mean, it was like six hours of tennis, like every day. Obviously, that's exaggerating, but how do you change that philosophy? I mean, I, I feel like at USDA will probably hate me for saying this, but it's very typical for tennis players to just play way too much and not spend that much time in the gym. How would you go about changing that? Well, I think there has a mentality has to be changed with why you're doing what you're doing. Are you doing it just because that's what they did years ago and that's what you feel you know, you need you, you need to feel good about doing that much to feel like you're ready? Um, which actually is more of a, a, a mental perspective, which is where maybe Dr. Larry Lauer could uh, help with that, but what people need to basically feel uh, fulfilled or satisfied or ready. Um, again, I think it just comes down to the same point of unless you're you know more flexible, unless you're stronger, unless you know how to move, unless you're efficient at moving, you're just not going to last as long. And if you don't last as long, you, you can't play as long, you're not going to be healthy. So that's always the goal it's can we stay healthy long enough to build up the practice time that it takes and the match count that it takes to push somebody's game to a new level do you enjoy watching tennis and and working in this line well i'm not saying i don't enjoy it i have so much more respect for it than i did before now that i'm in a tennis only situation because i I mean it could be the the sport that taxes every system at at a very very high level and the amount of skill needed to play is is mind-blowing i mean to to move that fast and to hit a ball that's moving that fast at several different angles and spins and place it where you want to be or where you want it to go and think one or two shots ahead um it's incredible i mean i do like watching it it's uh you know the the nature of the sport though is somewhat challenging because you're out on the i mean you know like it's not like other sports where you have a start time, right? And sometimes an end time, but you know, you can be waiting. Is it going to be raining? Is it this or that? You know, that that's the challenge sometimes. So I just have a question for those parents that are listening and have young junior kids and want to have them out on the court all the time. If you had a a a daughter or son that played tennis and you knew that they wanted to become you know a top level junior or top level pro how many hours would you say if you could say how many hours a day would you be spending on the court compared to mobility and training in the gym you mean time on court versus time off time on gym yes so i mean you can you could say it's a one-to-one ratio at a younger age if you want. I mean, you literally, it, again, it's all about quality, uh, you know, and intensity. Sometimes, again, people are just on the court to say they're on the court, you know, and half the practice they're just kind of lollygagging around. But if you're committed to, like, deliberate practice and being really purposeful and having high intensity, you do that for an hour, an hour and a half. I mean, between a warm-up and a good basic strength training routine, I mean, that's an hour, hour and a half as well and how many hours would you say it is nowadays you're you're saying that if you played tennis for an hour you should probably be in the gym for an hour as well would you say it's usually a two to one ratio for juniors today yeah that's about where it's at um even with the kids that we've seen this much progress with that's that's about right they're probably out there three hours two one and a half hour practices and we're in the gym about an hour i mean it, it, you know, depending on if if we're doing their warm up plus the training session, it actually could be an hour and a half off court, three hours on court. Hey everyone, we're here with Craig Aker, strength and conditioning coach here at the USTA National Campus, talking all things on how he helps American players do their best. Keep listening. What's your stance on tennis players doing Olympic powerlifting? I think that's the term because I remember at college at UCLA there was six to eight girls all doing the exact same workout and all of it was a lot of it in the gym would have been based on Olympic power weightlifting. Is that something that you're a believer in? Do you use that at all? Or as tennis sh- sh- players should be doing more body weight exercises and medicine balls and agility and speed? Nina, it's a good question. I like that. So we're right in the wheelhouse here, the Olympic lifting. Um, there's 
a lot of benefits with doing Olympic type of liftings. A lot of it just has to, actually has to do with just coordination, right? Getting the body to use multiple joints in a coordinated way, way to move weight efficiently. Um, you do strengthen the body in a way that mimics sport movement. Um, but, you know, you have to take the sport in consideration. So the Olympic lifting or basically moving weight fast and then having to catch the weight, uh, particularly if you talk about like a hang clean and you're catching it on your shoulders, a, a, a tennis athlete, number one, doesn't have to absorb b- body blows. Like they don't have to absorb somebody running into them like other sports, like a football player, even basketball, soccer. Like you have to learn how to absorb force. And that's where that lift is very beneficial. A tennis athlete doesn't do that, right? Let alone you have a lot of limb length issues and wrist mobility issues that would kind of predicate like that's probably not the smartest exercise to do i'm not saying it's bad and i'm also not saying if your athlete likes doing it and it is capable of doing it you shouldn't right it's just you know some of the focus can be just modifying how you're going to train that you know just hold weight and you can do weighted jumps just holding a weight in one arm or two arms and doing and doing jumps or your power training might just come from medicine ball throws you know there's always a d- different way to do it Arena, I kind of want to throw it to you. Are there certain things that you work on here at the USDA in the gym, things you like, things you don't like? Like, what's a typical workout with Craig like? Well, we can't have a workout without some weighted mobility. That literally says Craig Aker all over it. Um, We do love doing some med balls, core. I think those are some very fundamental exercises. And I think Coach Craig is also really great. Whenever he sees me right after I practice, it's not, okay, this is what you're doing, no questions asked. It's always like, okay, how are you feeling today? Like, how's the body? Do you want to do a little bit more, a little bit less on this? I think that's probably the biggest thing I've taken away from working with Craig and Satoshi. It's that they listen to me first instead of just telling me what I'm doing, um, which I think would be very beneficial for juniors to actually speak out about that. Um, Go ahead. But it sounds like you are very good about going to the gym, getting your workouts in, and you're also a little bit older. What happens when kids don't want to work out or even young pros are tired or cranky or just lazy? Like, I don't like working out that much. I'm not a pro athlete, but how do you motivate? I think that's to you, Craig. Yeah, they're, they're, they're over here. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just comment on what uh, Arena just said before. And that's actually where there's a lot of difference between the experienced older athlete and the younger athletes the the experienced and older athletes they have a sense of what makes them feel right okay and i'm not in a position to force them to do what maybe on paper and theoretically and scientifically is like this is the best thing for what i think right now for you is versus you've gotten this far in your career you know what makes you feel right how can we get that information and kind of blend them together right the younger athlete you just you really you have to teach them so much like they literally have to do like you know because it's all basic stuff you, you need to really get them through the you know the basic fundamentals uh with the exercises but with the the more pro level athlete you know you do want to kind of get a feel for what makes them feel right that that's important because like i tell people every body is different i mean that literally every body is different like so what might make me feel great you know a week or two month before a tournament or in a training block could be different than somebody else like you have you know there are exercises that you know you can say what are going to help work on this this and this but how everybody does it and how they feel doing it uh can be a little bit different so i probably spoke too long what was the the last you didn't i i guess what happens when a player walks in and isn't in the mood to work out do you send them home or you just say you know what you're doing this and or modify it you know how how malleable are you well this is what is really the foundation of this career is actually being a very good people person and getting to know people like you know when you're getting to know the athlete and maybe don't know them really well that can be a defining moment to where if i choose to kind of push them and hey what you know come on you you gotta want this like you know that could offend them and they could just you know call in a hole and be done with you you know but if you know the athlete and kind of know like hey they're normally pretty much they're into this they're normally into this and they're giving me some feedback that is contrary to that then you have to kind of start to you know do some research and dig up some facts uh, dig up some facts and just ask them some questions like, hey, 
know, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, like, yeah, I just I did terrible out there today, and you know, you kind of talk through a couple of things, and then and then go from there. So, but at the end of the day, I, I can never want it more than the athlete. Like it, it starts and ends there. I mean, if if they're a pro and the, you know all these opportunities that they have, which you know I envy a lot. I mean, the life of a pro athlete is pretty incredible. You know, but I can't want it more than them. So I'm pretty sure I'm not walking today because my hip flexor came out. But you know, the life of a pro is great. Um, what do you find is like the biggest challenge working with the the juniors compared to the pro level athletes? Uh, I, I do think that the teaching part is a challenge. Um, again, the body types, the phenotypes that are, in a, again, in a very highly skilled sport in tennis um, are a little bit different than the other athletes. And just actually getting them that their body awareness, getting them in positions that other athletes can normally do a little bit easier is, is a challenge. And just kind of keep that educational aspect, you know, here's why you're doing what you're doing. And actually getting them to the light bulb goes on for them too because sometimes it's hard for them to take what you do in the gym or even on court training to like really matter and that's unique to the sport too because you can actually be a very very high level athlete high level tennis athlete high level player and having not done a lot off i mean that's kind of the culture we're challenged with now with our jobs and you can play at a very high level just literally by playing because it's such a skill-based sport and you do need tons of reps. I mean, that's that's motor learning, that's motor skills. And there's thousands of different angles and spins and, and opportunities on the court. Like that's, it's almost, it's, you know, endless. So. I'm gonna touch on this a little bit with our hip flexor, but uh, a lot of players get injured. This is very, very common, very normal for you to deal with it. What's it like working with a player coming back from injury? How is it different to like a normal conditioning program? Well, first of all, with the injured athlete, that's, you know, you got to start with, all right, what can you do? All right. There's going to be limitations, but what can you do? And you want to try to challenge those <clears throat> at the highest level so that over time you're, you're basically trying to minimize the drop off. Like if people are hurt and they just kind of, well, I just got to rest and I got to wait till this to heal before I start doing anything. You're basically just lengthening your return to play. But you want to look at what, what limitations you have based on the injury, and then what can you do? If you have a, you know extreme lower body injury, well, then you're going to be doing a lot of upper body work and core. And maybe some lower body injuries mean you just can't play, but you can do some strength work for it. Or you just do non-impact cardiovascular work so that you're not stressing the joints, but you're getting some heart rate training. So you, you have to do as much as you literally can do so that you're going to ease the assimilation back into playing. Is it very common for you to sometimes have a differing opinion to the tennis coach when it comes to time on court or time in the gym? Uh, just in general, with yeah, I mean, I th I think th you know that's that's always the the key issue in being able to communicate with the tennis coach about you know w what it is they're doing and why, and then how much they're on court, and then fitting in our sessions. Because I know when I first got here, like we used to. Again, it's a culture thing, but we would get all the athletes at the end of the day. And I'm like looking at these kids coming in and they're fried, you know. I mean, you, almost every tennis practice is going to be hard or pretty hard to some degree. Whether it's a, even a skill-based session or movement-based session, it's going to be pretty taxing, right? So I'm like, you know, I, I don't want to be picking up scraps at the end of my day. Like, I don't have much. The athletes have nothing left for me. Like, what am I getting? Out? You know, so it's just that conversation is like, in fact, especially with the juniors, and I would still say with the pros, the training before practice actually is somewhat better because they're they're woken up like the body is fully, you know, it's actually been taxed a little bit. All systems go, you might say. And you have to look at what are you trying to do? or what do you have to do well in a match or a tournament is you need to perform the skill at a high level under fatigue well if i train you before your practice that's the situation you're going to be challenged with <clears throat> and those are conversations we have a lot and then you start basically managing your week well these many days i'm going to do it before these are after um you know we do like to get a lot of it in before noon you know or even before the second hit you know if you're going out twice versus you know, at the end of the at the end of the day is great if that's like a real light maintenance plan for that day. You're about to go to a tournament, that kind of thing. 
And then if they're injured, you have to factor in the physical therapist and the doctor and all these people that have opinions and notes. And Irina was just in Houston where Cece Bellis had a big week as well, as Irina did too. Um, how have you been helping Cece as she works back to playing full time? It's been quite a road for her. Yeah, it has. Um, Cece, just an incredible person because of the time away from the sport and literally coming here day in, day out. You know, starting her day really early, being here all day long, and you know she's not even on the court or not even competing. So that was a constant process of communicating with nutritionists, the athletic medicine team, uh, her coach, <clears throat> and us to keep formulating a plan and actually resetting that plan as we discovered that maybe a workload or a volume that she was used to doing might not be what's best for her now because of coming after the injuries, the surgeries, and, uh, you know, just trying to keep shaping it. So, you know, it was great to see her compete. I mean, that was awesome. I mean, that's what makes our job so great, you know, to see what went into it. And But, again, it's all about her. Like, that's a person where I, I don't want it more than her. <laughs> like, I can see she wants it more than me. Like, you don't go through o over a year and a half of what she went through and, you know, not want it as, you know, more worse than anybody else so that's just a testament to her it was great to see her success and um you know now we just now we have to reset it i mean we actually were just in a conversation earlier today that now we we got to say okay here's the time we have now to get you back out for you know however many number of tournaments Hey everyone, you're listening to the Tennis.com podcast with guest Craig Aker. We're talking about CeCe Bellis. Now he helped her come back from her arm injury. Keep listening. It's so common after a really good week or a really good couple weeks to just want to ride on that coaster, if you will. And unfortunately, that's when injuries can happen because you're like on this high and you're like, I just got to keep going. I got to keep going. But sometimes it's actually uh, better to rest. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the biggest things I find when I speak to junior parents or even pro level athletes are like, no, I have to be six hours on the court and I have to play the next four weeks. And I'm like, you really don't, mm -hmm. you know, you have to take care of your body first. So that's super important. That's one of the bigger challenges I've seen is the, the way the sport is run and the makeup of the sport, whether it's points or money or, I mean, yeah, you, you do love competing. Everybody loves the chance to win, but you know, at some point you have to look at in the big picture, like what are you getting out of another tournament, right? There's there's a tournament every weekend somewhere. There's never going to be a shortage of tournaments. But if you keep replacing any time you could use to basically physically develop or improve your physical preparedness to play the sport that you do love, like you're now you're just you're just trading things off and you're kind of just like, yeah, setting yourself up. You're like, well, you know, now you're just you hate to go into stuff and just be crossing your fingers because that's sometimes it's happening. You're just hoping like, well, you know, I'm just going to keep going play, you know, OK. <clears throat> There's so many ways, though, that I think players can get injured and get burnt out by doing things like that. I think I, I think and, and Cece, when we mentioned Cece, she's not a junior, but she's so young. Um, when you worked with her or when you still work with her and she's a specific elbow and arm and wrist injury. Can you talk a little bit about what the injury was and how? you train someone who has an arm injury, a right dominant arm injury. You know, did you work on her lower body instead for a while? How do you work back into it? I mean, I know she had, she's been on the podcast, she described four surgeries, there's a plate, there's a breaking of a bone. Hmm. You gotta be really careful, but then hmm. you gotta get back to playing tennis. So hmm. how did you work through that very specific, very severe injury? Yeah, that, I mean, again, that was, that was quite the process. I know it challenged myself uh, just at this point in my career to, to work in a situation like that. But you know, I'm not going to be the expert on the actual protocols for return to play for the health of the specific injured area. That was our athletic medicine team who did an incredible job. And even talking to the, her doctors and, and just the rehab plan. Um, again, we just, yeah, we literally we were doing two days because she wasn't on the court. But we were doing as much you know strength training as we could do, even if we were doing it on one side for the upper body or none at all in the upper body and just focus on legs. And then just a ton of movement like you not have the racket in your hand, but she didn't have, in this case, again, you do what you can do. She didn't have a lower body injury. She could, you know, run forever. And that was, I mean, in, in fact, I mean, that's one of her, what her coach told us too, like in her return to this tournament, it's like one of the biggest things that got her through these matches was she just was moving so well. That's the other, I mean, you do want to look for silver linings when people are hurt, 
that's a great opportunity to kind of sure up other areas that you maybe didn't spend as much time on because you're totally healthy and you do only have so much time. So you want to kind of train, com- you know, the body completely. All of a sudden you remove what you can do. You got to replace it with something else. And, oh, now I, you know, really shirt up some other things. Not that she was, she was never a bad mover anyway, but you just work more at it because it's kind of all we could do. But the, again, late in the game here goes back to like a pro athlete and figuring out what you know, works for them and what's appropriate. Like we really changed her, her volume on the court, um, which Irene was asking about, reduced it a lot to make sure she could go to this, you know, tournament healthy and, and ready to compete. With, um, with the way that CeCe competed and, you know, her results to be able to come back first, her first tournament and win high quality matches like that. Would you say that's your most gratifying moment as a coach? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's most gratifying for mine here at USTA for the few years I've been here. And that example is why I really enjoy doing what I do. I actually got a chance to um, be on the road with some of our juniors here for the first time a, a few weeks ago. And I mean, that's that's another whole different world there with, um, I mean, these are, you know, 14, 15 year old kids. And I mean, what a life. I mean, you're running around the country and you know, playing a sport for a living. If, I mean, I know they're doing their school and everything, how that works with virtual school. Um, but what, again, what they go through at a very young age with how their whole day, you know, how it's planned and what they're doing and, and things like that. So, um, and then to, you know, see them compete and, and uh, you know, we had a doubles team that won the championship there. So that was fun. So. That's awesome. My, uh, my final question is, Craig, you are strength and conditioning coach for the USDA. How do you stay fit? Do you have to work out every day, too, to, to maintain the image? Jeez, that's a tough one, so I keep that a secret. <laughs> I mean, you, you do need to obviously be able to show what you're doing. That's a big part of it. So um, uh, I, I don't get in as many of my sessions as I used to, so it's just the nature of life, unfortunately. Every time he shows us the exercise, he has to make sure he does at least two or three reps. So, you know, he's getting something in there. He's still got it. it. He's still got it. And you have the the USC National Campus facility. I mean, you can't be – there's nothing missing. Right, yep. We We do have it all. It's very good. All right, great. Well, um, that's it for this episode. We want to thank Craig Aker Aker for uh, for joining us. Thanks for having me. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. Thanks for listening. From the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, this has been the Tennis.com Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to stay caught up. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app, as well as Tennis.com slash podcast. You can also see the video of our episodes on Tennis Channel's YouTube page and Tennis.com's Facebook page. We're your hosts, Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. We'd like to thank our team, editor and audio designer Luke Mahoney, video editor Christina Koseva, Producers Alexa March and Sean O'Malley, and executive producers Shelby Coleman, Kyle Einhorn, and Andy Chu.